go to the next uh, slide, which is Mormon Doctrine uh, by Bruce R. McConkie, a Mormon apostle who is now dead. And in fact, they're trying to uh, throw his book under the bus. Uh, it, it's been in Mormon bookstores for ages, and it's been on Mormon bookshelves in every Mormon home that I've ever seen, uh, as long as for the last 30 years that I know of, at least. And I'm sure before that. But about Jesus Christ, he says on, the, on uh, page 92, thank you. Somebody's really keeping up with me. I appreciate that. My notes are so small that I can hardly read them up here. I need to have it up here. He says at the highlighted area there, you see, there is not one. Oh, let me explain first. He's going to talk about blood atonement. And blood atonement in Mormon history means having one's own bloodshed to pay for certain grievous sins for which the cleansing, the cleansing of the blood of Christ does not operate. So he says here, there is not one historical instance of so-called blood atonement in this dispensation, nor has, has there been one event or occurrence whatever of any nature from which the slightest inference arises that any such practice either existed or was taught. Boy, did he hammer that one down. Um, I mean, he's flatly denying that it was ever taught. And then over in the next paragraph, where you see that other highlight, on the same page, he teaches it. This is classic Mormon doublethink. Uh, but under certain circumstances, there are some serious sins for which the cleansing of Christ does not operate. And, it, and the law of God is that men must then have their own bloodshed to atone for their sins. Murder, for instance, is one of those sins. Now, you notice murder is not the only one of those sins. It's only one of them. Back in the day when they practiced blood atonement, and your Mormon friends will deny this vehemently, uh, but Brigham Young declared in one of his sermons, which is recorded in the Journal of Discourses, he, he said that, that he knows of instances where it was practiced, uh, where men lost their lives uh, to pay for their sins. And... Uh, so there are other sins, and they included, poly, uh, not, not polygamy, they were practicing that. Adultery and stealing and apostasy, those were all payable by shedding your own blood. You had, you had Mormon's, uh, Mormon sons shot out of the saddle by their own fathers trying to get out of the Salt Lake Valley just so they could pay for their sins. Now... What's the Bible say? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Uh, 1 John 1, 9. Let's go to the next uh, quote from Glenn Beck. Now, this is going to baffle a bunch of you. And when I saw this, uh, really, just a few days ago, it, uh, it set me back. He says, Glenn Beck said in his July 13, 2010 show, I don't know why I didn't get this earlier, but he says, you cannot earn your way to heaven. You can't. There is no deed, no random act of kindness, no amount of money to spread around to others that earns you a trip to heaven. It can't happen. It's earned by God's grace alone, by believing that Jesus Christ died on the cross for you. Amen to Glenn Beck. But... There's so much here that is maybe written between the lines or maybe just plain old missing. Uh, you notice he didn't say there's no religious ritual that you must participate in. Glenn Beck is, best I understand, a temple Mormon. He's temple worthy. I don't know how, but because the way he talks, it doesn't sound like it, but he... Um, He's temple worthy, and how could he get into the temple uh, without believing that that temple ritual that goes on in there, in fact, there's several rituals in there. One is eternal marriage, which I'm certain that he's had, and one is an endowment ceremony, which uh, gives them the keys to the kingdom of the upper kingdom of heaven, where they can become a god. 
And to be baptized for their dead relatives is an essential for their own salvation. So how he can, he just, he didn't mention those things here at all. But if he's a Mormon, he must believe that those things are necessary in order for him to be saved. But you notice, it may be that his choice of words were very crafty here. I'm not sure. He said, earns you a trip to heaven. But to Mormons, they are a universal religion. So a trip to heaven doesn't mean that you've earned eternal life. It, uh, just going to heaven is for everybody, according to Mormonism, except for a few apostates who kicked against the church after they left. And those people are sent to outer darkness forever. And those, uh, those are, they're called, uh, what's the term? Sons of yeah, thanks. Sons of perdition. I'm getting too old for this. Um, so I don't know how. So you see, he can get away with saying this around his Mormon friends because they know that even all of you who never accepted Mormonism will still achieve some level of glory in heaven. After you go to hell and pay for your sins, you get beat by a few stripes, and then it's a revolving door. You get to come out and go to one or more levels of heaven. Even those who deny Jesus Christ on this earth will still get to, to the lower level of Mormon heaven. And so uh, he can say this with a straight face, knowing full well that he's keeping back something that he should have revealed to you. I don't know. I'm not accusing him of doing that. He, he, may, uh, he may sincerely believe this to the bottom of his heart. I just don't know. Uh, but if he believes that temple rituals are necessary for his eternal destiny, then this cannot mean that Glenn Beck is a true Christian. On the other hand, if Glenn Beck really does believe in the God of the Bible, and if he has poured his heart out to him, and if, which is what it sounds like when he talks on TV about his faith, uh, then he may just be a Christian in the wrong place and who's a little confused about the details. But if you go back to that, where, to his book, The Seven Wonders, how could he have been partners in a book that says, just believe in any high, higher power you want? He cannot be trusting Jesus Christ of the Bible, who said, I am the way and the truth and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me, by me. He's confused, and he's got me confused. And if you're still confused, welcome to the club. <laughs> yeah. No, I don't. since he's been married. That, I know that's not a date, but now let's look at uh, let's look at Mormon salvation because what Glenn Beck just said, or that quote that I just gave you from Glenn Beck, does not square with what his church teaches. Let's look at the next slide, and uh, what we have is uh, we're, we're looking again at the Mormon doctrine, and we're going to be looking at page 60, 669 through 670. We're going to spell out three different Mormon plans of salvation here. Number one is unconditional or general salvation, that which comes by grace alone without obedience to gospel law. Now, that may be what we just heard Glenn Beck say. See? He said grace alone. And here's Mormon doctrine saying grace alone, coming right from one of their prophets and apostles, Bruce McConkie. It consists in the mere fact of being resurrected. That's it. It doesn't say anything about what, what your rewards are or your punishments are. It's just you're going to be resurrected. Well, we all know that. But what is, what is our final destination? That's what we care about. But this, this unconditional salvation that comes by grace alone doesn't have anything to do with eternal life, according to Mormonism. Um, it says... This kind, in the next paragraph after the highlight there, this kind of salvation eventually will come to all mankind excepting only the sons of perdition. 
You heard it from a Mormon apostle and prophet himself. Now, on the next page, on the next column, same page, uh, the next highlighted area there. But this is not the salvation of righteousness, the salvation which the saints seek. Those who gain only this general or unconditional salvation will still be judged according to their works and receive their places in a terrestrial or telestial kingdom. The telestial is their bottom kingdom, terrestrial is the middle, and celestial is the top kingdom. And even that one is divided into three kingdoms. Uh, and the upper level of that one is where you become a god after eons of improving and perfecting yourself. Now, you notice he says, we'll still be judged according to their works. If you didn't accept Joseph Smith as a prophet of God and the Mormon church as a true church, the one true church, you're going to have to pay for that. But you still will be able to get out of hell and, and go to the terrestrial kingdom afterwards because after all you did give some sort of lip service to God. Now, it says, they will therefore be damned. Now, listen to this definition of Mormon damnation. Their eternal progression will be cut short. That's what they mean by damnation. That, In other words, you can't go on and progress to becoming a god. You're going to have to be stuck being a servant in a lower kingdom. Tough luck. And yet, uh, Joseph Smith described the terrestrial kingdom, the telestial kingdom, the lower one, as a place so wonderful that if you could get a little glimpse of it, you would commit suicide to get there. So, you know, this is wonderful Mormon, I mean, heaven, uh, glory in heaven for those who didn't even acknowledge Jesus Christ while they were alive. And the Bible says what? After, uh, after this life? It's appointed once for a man to die and then the judgment. Not a choice to, of which kingdom you want to go to. Okay, uh, now, conditional, here's uh, the next one. Conditional or individual salvation. And by the way, Glenn Beck has said that, that faith in Christ is an individual, a matter of individual salvation. I think he's a little confused. Because here's individual salvation according to Mormonism. That which comes by grace coupled with gospel obedience consists in receiving an inheritance in the celestial kingdom of God. That's the upper level that I just told you about. This kind of salvation follows faith, repentance, baptism, receipt of the Holy Ghost, and continued righteousness to the end of one's mortal, life, uh, mortal probation. Now... At the bottom of this page, uh, this is page 670 of uh, Mormon Doctrine, I'm going to zero in on the, the highlighted sections there so you can actually read what he's saying. Number three, salvation. In its true, salvation in its true and full meaning is synonymous with exaltation or eternal life and consists in gaining an inheritance in the highest of the three heavens within the celestial kingdom. With few exceptions, this is the salvation of which the scriptures speak. So he's saying that in general, this exaltation is what the Bible's talking about when it, when it speaks of heaven. Or when it speaks of salvation, excuse me. It is the salvation which the saints seek. Now he's talking about Mormons when he says saints, not you saints. You guys are apostate saints. There is no gift greater than the gift of salvation. Oh, it says, it is, it is of this which the Lord says, there is no gift greater than the gift of salvation. Sounds like some gift, huh? And listen to what it takes to get this gift. This full salvation is obtained in and through the continuation of the family unit in eternity. That means you have to be married in a Mormon temple. Uh... And you have to follow certain legalistic standards in order to be eligible for that, of course. And those who obtain it are gods. Full salvation is attained by virtue. Let's see here. Oh, yeah, you're keeping up with me. Thanks, Thomas. I wasn't even giving you the sign. Boy, he's on a stick. Um, 
Full salvation is attained by virtue of knowledge, of knowledge, truth, righteousness, and all true principles. Many conditions must exist in order to make such salvation available to men. Without the atonement, the gospel, the priesthood, the sealing power, there would be no salvation. And, and he goes on. Without continuous revelation, the ministering of angels, the working of miracles, the prevalence of gifts of the Spirit, there would be no salvation. And this, is, this takes the cake. If, if it had not been for Joseph Smith and the restoration, there would be no salvation. And here comes the big one. There is no salvation outside the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Should Christians be fooled into joining hands, uh, yoked together unequally with Glenn Beck? I, I'm sorry, until he makes it clear what he believes, I, I, I don't think we can risk it. And I, I don't mean to be... Uh, to be ugly to him. Yeah. There's one thing, he's an alcoholic and he's gone through the, the, the 12 steps of the higher, higher power used in that. So he's probably mixing that up. That's, it sounds like he is. I think you're right, that he's mixing up the, the 12 step program of AA with, with his Christianity. Let me, let me rip through this. Uh, make a note of your questions. Please, because I, I would love to answer them, but I know Todd's going to be on me to get this finished uh, on time, and rightfully so. And, in fact, it's time for me to quit right now. Okay. All right. Let me rip through it. And, and then at a quarter of, if I haven't answered questions by then, please come up, and I'll, I'll stay as long as you want to ask questions, and I'll eat with you if, if that's what it takes. Okay. Now, um, so there we have Mormon salvation, and it doesn't sound anything like the salvation that, that Glenn Beck is purporting to support, to believe. Now, what does the Bible say? Of course, you all know it by heart, most of you. It is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves. It's a gift of God not by works so that no one can boast, including Glenn Beck and me. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. And by the way, if you're witnessing to Mormons or Jehovah's Witnesses, you must go on and quote them verse 10. Don't you dare leave that off because they must understand that it's due to our salvation that we go on to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do, after our salvation, that's in verse 10, Ephesians 2.10. For we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. We cannot leave that off. Now, uh, I'll tell you what, I'm going to, uh, I'm just going to say Mormons are, uh, I'm going to skip a couple of slides here. Just go ahead and, and flick a couple of them, uh, Thomas, and I'll. Yeah, go past that and that one. And we're going to stop with the, the next slide. Stop on the next one. Uh, it, it, it comes from the very top that Mormons are taught that, uh, that they're not to reveal everything that they believe to you uh, at first blush. I mean, they've got to... I don't want to use words that, that, that make it sound like our Mormon friends are, think they're being deceptive because they don't think they are. They're taught that they must seduce you a little at a time. And, and I shouldn't even use the word seduce because they would not think of it that way. They think of, of doing everything they can to protect your feelings so that you can be uh, welcomed into the true church, the one true church without scaring you away by, by revealing all those uh, scary things to you. You know, like, like you've got to go through the temple ritual and they can't tell you what it's about until you go there and then you're embarrassed because it's so, you know, it makes you so uncomfortable you don't know what to do, so you go through it anyway. And a, a lot of Mormons have, have uh, described that feeling as they went through. Anyway, uh, the reason they don't do it is in, on this, um, I'm going to have to turn around to read this. Uh, this is an interview by the San Francisco Chronicle uh, reporter. Um, I've, it's in uh, April 1997. He was, uh, 
he was um, interviewing Gordon B. Hinckley, the president and prophet, seer and revelator of the church at the time. And he said to the prophet, he says, there are some things, uh, wait, there are some differences in your beliefs, uh, significant differences in your beliefs. For instance, don't Mormons believe God was once a man? And the very first words out of the prophet's mouth were, I wouldn't say that. And this is what Mormon missionaries will feed you too. I've, 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 said, I've asked the same question in front of uh, prospects of the Mormon missionaries, and they would say, where does it say that? And so you have to know. And then he goes on, he goes on and on and on uh, trying to get out of this because he, when he said, I wouldn't say that, he's denying his faith in front of uh, the entirety of the Mormon faith because uh, this is a public uh, publication. And so then he saves it by saying, oh, yeah, we do believe in eternal progression. Of course, to the Mormons, that's code for we believe that you can become a god and that God was once a man. But he, so he says that, but the public doesn't know that he's admitting what the reporter asked him. These people are very, very sly. And uh, just because they're sweet and nice does not mean that we don't have to look under that uh, sheep's clothing and see what's under there. Uh, I mean, my wife is a Mormon. I love her to death. We've been married for 29 and a half years now. She's a sweetheart, but she's deceived to the toenails. And, and we've just got to take everything with a grain of salt and, and turn everything inside out until we understand it. Now, uh, is it any of our business? I mean, our Mormon friends will say, aren't you just kind of, uh, uh, you know, you're just um, splitting hairs here, doctrinal hairs. Say, well, they'll say, well, I'm not a scriptorian like you. I just go by, my, by what I believe and, and what the Spirit tells me. Well, I hear a lot of Christians say that too. I'm sorry, but you ought to be getting your face in the Word so you know what you believe and why you believe it. But our Mormon friends believe what they believe because it feels good to them. They get a burning in the bosom that... that verifies that the Book of Mormon is from God because they've been put on, they've been put under pressure to pray about that and to get a good feeling. So they do. But anyway, uh, in 2 Corinthians 11, 3, uh, it says, Paul is worried about the Corinthians. He says, but I'm afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, your minds may somehow be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. And then he says, for if someone comes to you and preaches a Jesus other than the Jesus we preached, or if you receive a different spirit from the spirit you received, or a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it easily enough. And by the way, the Mormon gospel is 180 degrees different than it was in 1835 when their first Doctrine and Covenants came out. Um, Maybe next year I'll I'll do that one. And it's astounding. What, what they changed in so few years. Um, they used to sound like Glenn Beck, and, and nine years later, it was a totally different show. He says, for such people are false apostles, in, in verse 13 and through 15, deceitful workers, masquerading as apostles of Christ. Boy, Paul would not have been politically correct today, would he? And no wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. Like maybe like the one Joseph Smith said he saw. It is not surprising then if his servants also masquerade as servants of righteousness. Then in uh, 1 Timothy um, 4 and verse 1 and verse 6, it says, uh, The Spirit clearly says that in later times some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. If you point these things out to the brothers and sisters, you will be a good minister of Christ Jesus. So let's not be ashamed to be politically incorrect and and to speak the truth in love. And and at the same time, I I know that there are people who are publicly denouncing Mormonism and using all sorts of nasty language and and, uh, really hurtful things that they say without being careful to, to just stick to the facts and be matter of fact about this and, and lovingly uh, drag our 
Mormon friends to the cross. But we're going to have to do that with gentleness and respect as the Bible commands us. I'm ready for questions. Next slide. Okay, well, women are involved in eternal progression, but it's not becoming a god. Uh, that's for sure. Because, you see, they have, they have, a man cannot become a god without a woman in Mormonism. He has to have a wife in order to become a god. Because they have to procreate spirit children throughout eternity who will go through the same progression, and, and some of some few of those will become gods. Actually, if you look at the Mormon uh, gospel and all it entails, you will know that none of them are ever going to make it. It is an impossible gospel. And by the way, there's a tract. And let me say real quickly, on, uh, I brought a, an exhibit that, that my friend Kim threw up for about an hour, and, and it'll be here until for a, little while, a lot longer, but not all night. So I urge you to rush back there and grab some of the literature on that table. One of those is a tract called, Is the Gospel Good News to You? And it's all about how perfect a Mormon has to live his life during this life if he wants to achieve uh, perfection. And uh, they don't, and it, it also uh, encourages our Mormon friends to, to camp on uh, Hebrews 10, 14, or is it 14, 10, if, where uh, it says that, that uh, it is by one sacrifice that he made perfect forever those who are being made holy. So, I mean, right there in that one passage, he, he explains how, how we're made perfect, but Mormons think they have to go through eons and eons of perfection before they can make it. <clears throat> um, did, I get, did I answer that thoroughly enough? Okay. Do women go through the temple? Yes. I, oh, and you know, I didn't thoroughly answer that because I didn't tell you about the women. The women get to become goddesses, you know, and their husbands will be the gods, of course. And they get to be eternally pregnant throughout eternity, popping out babies one after another. Now, also, they, they are going to have to be polygamous. Uh, if, you can, if you did the math, I, I wish I had done the math so I could spin this out for you. I, I don't have it on the tip of my tongue. But if you could do the math and figure out from the beginning of the earth and how much population there has been on the earth, and if you could figure out how many, uh, and by the way, the gestation period is the same. By the way, would everybody turn their phones off so that, so that I don't have to hear uh, this kind of nonsense? Uh, <clears throat> sheesh. Uh, would, uh, where was I? Oh, yeah. There's a, a nine-month gestation period, just like on Earth, okay? So if God could only produce, with one wife, one baby every nine months, do you think that the billions of people who have lived on the Earth would have been here? Uh-uh. It would have taken thousands of wives. And I don't, again, I don't have the math figured out. Someday I'll, I'll, uh, I'll get those. Somebody's done that. And I'll get that and, and expose it maybe next year. But... Uh, it would just take an enormous tribe or, or harem of wives to produce that many babies in that shorter period of time. You know, two, th oh, yeah, go ahead. <coughs> Do uh, Mormons have in print that Isaiah 43.10 is not translated correctly? Do Mormons have in print that Isaiah 43.10 was not translated correctly? No, they do not. It's a perfect question because when we quote that to our Mormon friends and they say, well, you know, that may be one of those parts that's not transmitted or translated correctly. Well, I got news for our Mormon friends. Uh, the Joseph Smith translation left that verse untouched. So it's the same in the Joseph Smith translation as it is in the King James Version. Yeah. And, and, yeah. It's mentioned here that women cannot be resurrected unless they have a husband to take off their veil. Well, what it is is the, the women, when they go through the Mormon uh, 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 ritual, the, the endowment ceremony, they're given a, a secret name, and so are the men. And they're not to share that name with each other. I mean, I mean I'm sorry, with other people. 
the man has to know the woman's secret name in order to call her out of the grave at the resurrection. That's true. Now, I, I can imagine. Now, Mormon women deny this, but I can imagine if I were a Mormon woman that I would uh, feel a little bit uh, kind of you know, under the thumb there because if they don't please their husbands, uh, why would they want to call their name? And, and I have heard many, many uh, stories about Mormon wives reminding their husbands of that secret name, you know, asking him to make sure he still knows it, you know. I, I don't know. It's such, it, it's such uh, I don't want to use name calling or anything, but it seems like such childish nonsense to, to me. This, this hand over here has been up for a long time, and, and I'll get over here. Go ahead. That's an interesting question. What happens to my wife who's married to an unbeliever? Uh, and it's, uh, you know, it's, it's really strange that, uh, and it's tragic at the same time, that Mormons have very, they are legalists. They've got very strict laws that they need to obey and, and follow. And yet, there's always a way out. Uh, in other words, it's taught in Mormonism that a woman cannot get to the celestial kingdom without a husband, and neither can a husband get to the celestial kingdom without a wife. Now, theoretically, that, has to be, that would have to be done in the temple on the earth. But just as baptism is done for the dead, so is marriage performed for the dead. So my wife figures that now I'm... I'm only speculating a little bit here because she has told me some of this. My wife assumes that because Heavenly Father knows that she was faithful to the true gospel of Mormonism, just because her husband wasn't faithful to the Mormon gospel doesn't mean that she shouldn't have a husband for eternity. So God will simply provide one through vicarious marriage after I'm gone, even after she's dead, even if she doesn't find another husband for the rest of her life on the earth after I'm gone, Heavenly Father will surely provide her a husband for eternity. And, and that, that could be a vicarious marriage even after she's dead. It won't matter. And, you know, you might say, my first thought is, well, gosh, you want to risk that? You know, having a, somebody just match you up with somebody and how you know you're going to like him? Well, Heavenly Father wouldn't put me with anybody that I'm not going to enjoy, right? I mean, it's no wonder that Jesus took that temptation away from us when he said they're neither married nor given in marriage in heaven. You err because you do not know the scriptures. And so anybody that thinks they're going to be married in heaven, I mean, forget it. And the boss already told us. Uh, now, there was somebody else right behind you, Betty. Uh, was another hand up? Oh, was that your question? Oh, okay. Now, over here were two more. I, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. Are lat- I thought you said Latter-day Saints and Mormon are the same. Or do they practice polygamy? Well, the, the, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is the Mormon Church. They don't like for you to call it the Mormon Church but that's what it is. And in fact, by the way, they call it the Mormon church themselves. You know, it's kind of like white people don't like to be called honkies by black people. Okay. So that explains the uh, Waco incident where the man had several wives. Well, now see, those people in Waco, those were fundamentalist Mormons. They have divorced themselves from the, uh, from the mainline Mormon church in Utah in Salt Lake City. And they have, in fact, uh, stuck to Joseph Smith and Brigham Young's original teachings about polygamy. And it's, it, it, those are the faithful Mormons, in fact. If you look at Mormon history and Mormon uh, doctrine, those are the people who are faithful to the original Mormon teachings. Now, yeah. 
why the women were very silent about it, telling anybody about their situation because they were uh, the chosen or whatever. I'm not sure what that was. The last part you said that kind of confirms there the way they, they acted with their several wives. Uh, one man had to have a wife, so the, all these women had to have the wife. Uh, a husband. And he was the only guy Yeah, that may be the reason. I, I don't know how they. I don't know how these guys talk women into getting married to, to one man. I don't. I don't get it. Uh, but I'm over time. And if you want to ask me any more questions, just come on up here. I'll be putting my stuff away, and I can chit chat with you as long as you want.